there. So we're going to continue on with our um, study of chapter 12, and we're going to be sort of loosely talking about this section in the textbook that um, is entitled Quantum States and Nuclei. But I do have to warn you that I'm not terribly impressed with this textbook's discussion of this subject. Um, so I'm giving you a link here to a hyperphysics website, a free online website that tells you a little bit about some of the things that I'll be talking about today, and you can surf around for that. Or if you happen to have a copy of Thornton and Rex's Modern Physics, um, or you want to check out another Modern Physics textbook from the library, it might be good to supplement this a little bit. I'll go into the level of depth that you'll need on the subjects that aren't covered in the textbook in the lecture, but sometimes it helps to do a little background reading. So moving on though, I'm going to talk about two different models of the nucleus. This is the liquid drop model and the shell model. Um, now the liquid drop model, the first one that I want to talk about, is the one that sort of models what those binding energies are. Now we discussed in the last lecture how to calculate a binding energy in that you um, sum up the individual masses of the protons and the neutrons that are in the nucleus and then um, you subtract off the mass of the nucleus in its bound state, what the measured mass of the nucleus is. And that little delta m times c squared using Einstein's equation gives you the binding energy for the nucleus and then you can divide that by the total number of nucleons to get the binding energy on a per nucleon basis. And so the liquid drop model does a good job of predicting what the binding energy per nucleon um, is. So this model is based on um, the idea that the nucleons act like molecules in a drop of liquid, hence the name. Um, they interact really strongly with one another. In other words, you know, if you had a water drop, for example, you'd have a very uh, a large dipole moment, and then that dipole moment would want to, you know, interact with and line up other dipole moments, but only pretty much the ones right next to it. And that's kind of how nucleons are in this model, because the strong force is very strong, um, but it's also very short range, and so um, that, that sort of dictates how the model uh, works. So this liquid drop model basically says you've got these um, nucleons and they're jiggling around next to each other. They're interacting very strongly with one another in a short range kind of way, and this is sort of how um, uh, molecules in a drop of liquid work. Now, the volume effect, the liquid drop model is a, a, a mathematical equation that has multiple terms in it, and each one of these terms predicts um, a certain aspect of the model. So the first is the volume effect. Because the nuclear force or the strong force on a given nucleon is only to the very closest nearest neighbors because it is so short range and only acts along the order of a femtometer or two, and it doesn't interact with all the other nucleons um, in the uh, nucleus. So what it's saying is basically the force is going to be proportional to the volume because it's proportional to the number of nucleons. So the total binding energy is going to be proportional to the um, mass number A, and that's because it's proportional to the nuclear volume. And remember that um, when you calculate a volume, you're cubing your radius, and your radius, according to the equation that we talked about in a previous lecture, is r naught a to the one-third power, where A is the number of nucleons, and r naught is 1.2 femtometers. Um, and this contributes to the binding energy. Of course, as you add more nucleons on, then that's going to change the binding energy. The next is the surface effect, and that's because um, anytime you have a bulk molecule, it's going to be interacting with nucleons that are on all sides. I'm sorry, anytime you have a bulk nucleon, um, getting my words mixed up, it interacts with the nucleons that are on all sides of it, right? So it has more interactions if you're in the middle of the drop as opposed to being on the surface of the drop, then you have a side where there's no nucleons to touch, okay? So that changes the surface energy. So nucleons on the surface have fewer neighbors than those in the interior, and surface nucleons are going to reduce the binding energy by an amount proportional to their number because they're not bound to as many nearest neighbors. <laughs> 
It just makes sense. So that means that the number of nucleons is going to be proportional to the surface area. And as you might remember, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. And because of the equation r is equal to r naught a to the 1 third, that means that you raise the mass number to the 2 thirds power because you're going to square that r, which makes it r naught squared a to the 2 thirds power. Um, and that's where that a to the 2 thirds power comes from there. Okay, And it's going to reduce the binding energy, so that's a subtracting term. The next is the Coulomb repulsion effect. Because um, the protons interact with one another uh, very strongly, they're very close together and they repel one another, that's going to change your binding energy. It's going to do it according to Coulomb's law, K, Q1, Q2 over R is your potential energy for that. And so um, remembering that R is equal to 1.2 femtometers times A to the 1 third, you're going to have in your reduction in binding energy term, that's why there's a negative sign there. Um, the negative sign, the reduction of binding energy is going to pr be proportional to 1 over a to the 1 third power because of that. It's also going to have this z here and z minus 1. That's due to the charge in the nucleus. The atomic number z is the number of protons. Um, the whole minus 0 0.72 why it's z times z minus 1. There's a full derivation for that that I'd really rather not to go into, but it has to do with the self-energy of um, assembling a collection of point charges. It's a problem that you might do in uh, intermediate physics two or something like that. Um, I don't want to go into it here, but it does reduce the binding energy proportional to the amount of the charge on the nucleus squared and then divided by a to the one third. The symmetry effect, as we discussed, um, for light elements, um, less than 20 mass number or so, uh, the number of protons and number of neutrons is roughly the same. But then as you increase your number of protons, you need to stick more and more neutrons on there to compensate for that repulsive Coulomb force and add attractive force without adding more charge. Um, and so basically this term just tries to account for that. It subtracts the number of neutrons minus the number of protons and it divides by the total mass number, right? So um, when your mass number is small, if you have a large asymmetry between n and z, then that makes that term large. But for a large atomic mass number, the denominator reduces the value of the term, so it has little effect on the overall binding energy, and that's, um, that's what that does. Okay, so if you put all these terms together, then your binding energy in n <coughs> in NEV, sorry about that, is a constant times A minus another constant times A to the two-thirds minus some constants times A to the minus one-third and then minus some constants over A and then plus a little fudge factor delta. Um, and then what you do is you have these constants A, B, A, A and some A, S uh, and it's just fit to the experimental data so those act like fit constants. So this is the model. Now this equation fits the known nuclear mass values pretty well. Um, the deal is it explains vibrational excitations of nuclei and other phenomena like that very well. If you think of a nucleus, if you look at the liquid drop model, let's say that you give it some energy via a gamma ray or something and get it in an excited state, it'll squish out and squish back together and kind of wiggle like a water droplet would. Um, and this model explains that very well. However, it doesn't work for everything. It's a model that has its failings. And that's some of the finer details of the nuclear structure, like instability why some light elements are naturally radioactive. It doesn't explain the angular momentum or the magnetic moments of the nucleus, and so um, there's some issues there. Also, if you look at the binding energies closely, then you can see that there's going to be these irregularities in this fit, um, and it shows you some nuclei that are more stable than the model would predict. Actually, there's a difference between the binding energy per nucleon given by that formula and what the experiments show. If you look at the data, plot of the residuals, where you subtract the predicted binding energy from the actual binding energy, then you can see that there's definite peaks in the data. This is not noise, this is some sort of systematic error and it occurs at very special numbers. And they came to be known as the magic numbers. And those magic numbers have value of 2, 8, 20, 28, 52, and 82. Okay, So it was noticed that this 
has some of the periodicity to it that you see in the shell of um, electrons in, in their orbit around atoms, right? For the s orbital, you've got two electrons. For a full s and p orbital, you have eight electrons. So there was some symmetry there that led people to believe that even though the potentials weren't same, weren't the same that you would plug in to say the Schrodinger equation, it's not the same potential energy. Even though that wasn't the case, there was still some sort of shell structure to it, okay? Um, so these peaks are reminiscent of the peaks in the graphs, the ionization energy atoms, and led to the shell model of the nucleus. I do want to emphasize that it's a different shell structure than the structure for the electron. And the reason for that is remember that the shell structure for the electron came from the solution of the Schrodinger equation using the Coulomb potential energy plugged in for the Coulomb potential energy function. So the strong force is definitely not a 1 over r squared potential. And so it's not going to be the same. Really what happens is instead of sort of visualizing uh, like you do for the electron, them in some sort of orbit, right, even if it's a crazy orbit, it is kind of an orbit, instead of visualizing that, really you should visualize the, the nucleons behaving more like a gas of neutrons and protons, and then those obey a Fermi Dirac distribution. And so in a sense, it's a little bit more like a square well potential or square sphere potential, I guess, or, you know, a hard wall sphere potential, or maybe a harmonic oscillator potential in some ways than it is like the others. So if you want to put something in your head, maybe that's a good one. Now the um, woman that worked out the shell model for the nucleus that is uh, used widely today to predict a wide variety of um, phenomena is Maria Geppert Mayer here. She died in 1972, just a couple of years before I was born actually. Um, she's a German scientist and she de de developed the shell model of the nucleus and she shared the Nobel Prize for that work with Hans Jensen, who simultaneously developed a similar model, but not quite the same. Um, so she, uh, she was very important in nuclear physics. Now, the shell model is also sometimes called the independent particle model. This is the second model we're going to be talking about, okay? In this model, each nucleon is assumed to exist in a shell of quantized energy states. So this is similar, but not exactly the same as the idea that we had for the shell model of the uh, electrons in their orbits around the nucleus. Now, as opposed to the liquid drop model, which visualizes each nucleon sort of jiggling around and bumping into other nucleons, this doesn't do that. This is different. In the shell model, the, the vision that you have in your head is that there's not actually very many collisions between the nucleons. And the reason for that, this is a very quantum idea, and it has to do with the Pauli exclusion principle. So the idea is that in order to collide inelastically, um, you have to transfer energy. And if there's no place for that nucleon to go in its energy level, if it doesn't have a, an existing quantum jump that it can make that matches the energy transferred, then that won't happen. Okay, so in order for an inelastic collision to occur, then it has to be excited into another quantum state. One of them has to be excited into a new quantum state. If there's no open states, it won't collide. So in the shell model, there's many fewer collisions. They're very rare as opposed to the liquid drop model where you, um, you're modeling it that way, that they collide. So here's kind of a picture, a simplified picture of the shell model. And here you have a set of allowed states, and you have to think of your neutrons and your protons separately. They each get their own energy well, okay? Um, the proton energy levels are actually a little further apart and a little higher as compared to those for the neutrons. In this picture here, the protons are shown in orange and the neutrons are shown in green, and you can see the energy levels are spaced differently, and the proton energy levels are are a little bit higher than the corresponding neutron energy level, okay? Now the reason for that is of course because the neutrons are neutrally charged, there's no charge on them, they don't interact with one another via the Coulomb potential, and so that makes their energy states lower as compared to the protons which have that repulsive force between them. So nuclei tend to have more neutrons than protons, and the reason for that is the proton energy levels are higher. So as Z increase and the higher states are filled, a proton level for a given quantum number will be much higher in energy than the neutron level for the same quantum number. And it's energetically favorable for that nucleus to convert. Now I know this sounds strange, but if you have a proton up here and then unfilled 
states for the neutron here, what will happen is radioactive decay will occur called beta decay and that proton will become a neutron and fall into the energy state for the neutron. It does that because neutrons and protons are basically composed of the same quarks, okay? It flips one quark and it can become a neutron. Spoiler alert, we're going to talk about that later, okay? Um, so that's why the number of neutrons tends to be greater than the number of protons because there's these available energy states um, and the energy states are lower and so decay occurs simply to, to, to lower the energy of the nucleus. Now, nuclei with even numbers of protons and neutrons are going to be more stable. And that's because um, you have these spins, which like to pair up, up and down, um, which lowers the angular momentum. An extra pro proton or neutron can be added only at the expense of increasing the nucleus's energy, and that leads to a greater instability in the nucleus. And then you're going to have these magic numbers, the 2, 8, and so on and so forth that I mentioned earlier, 2, 8, 20, 28, and 50, so on and so forth. And those are particularly stable because they have completely filled shells. Okay, completely filled shells. So if you have a spin up and a spin down that pairs off, your angular momentum is a little lowered, that lowers your energy. And if you have a completely filled shell, just as we saw with the electrons, it's going to be lowered even more. And that's why they saw those deviations from the liquid drop model prediction um, in the magic numbers. Now you might notice if you look at this plot more carefully, which I stole from hyperphysics by the way, that S, P, D, and F are used for the angular momentum quantum numbers just like the electrons. And it means the same thing. S is um, your angular momentum number equaling zero, P is one, and so on and so forth. But because it's a different potential, the restrictions on the quantum numbers aren't the same because the potential is not the same. So for example, in the hydrogen atom, if you had n equal to 2, then L could only go up to 1, right? Which meant that if you were in the n equal to 2 state, then your highest um, value could be um, uh, p. You couldn't have any orbital above p. But if you look here at this plot, you've got a 1g state, which would never be allowed for an electron. And it's just because the um, potential energy is different, so the solution um, to the um, equation using the Schrodinger equation or whatever is going to give you a different value, and so your quantum numbers are different. Now you might notice over here, here's your states, uh, 1s, 1p, 1d, so on and so forth. And then it shows splitting, and it calls that the spin orbit effect. Basically, what's going on there, in a conceptual kind of way, let me just explain it, it's very similar to the Zeeman effect, okay? And what's happening is a strong internal magnetic field, that means it doesn't have to be in an external magnetic field, there's already a magnetic field there just due to the atom itself, so there's a strong internal magnetic field that's causing the splitting of that energy state, so the energy level splitting is present all the time, for, for instance, um, and the energy levels are split. So it's an internal magnetic field splitting of the energy levels. Okay, so here's another view of what the nuclear potential looks like as felt by the neutron and proton. Now you might notice that um, the neutron decays off to zero as R goes to zero, whereas the proton, it feels this attractive potential here, and then it goes up, see here, and you have a repulsive potential, um, and then it decays off to zero. And that's, of course, because the protons are like charge, and so there's a repulsive area right here. And then once you get past that repulsive area, then the strong force takes over and pulls them closer together. So this is a superposition, in other words, of the Coulomb repulsive force and the strong nuclear force, um, which is always attractive. So um, now, if you look here, it shows you um, in the drawing, it looks a little bit like a harmonic oscillator plot. If you look just at the neutron, you can see that um, you have these uh, energy levels here indicated in blue until it reaches what's called the Fermi level and then they turn to black. So the black are the unoccupied states and the blue are the occupied energy states. So in other words you've got nucleons filling up all the blue states until you reach the black state and then those are unfilled states. Okay. Um, in the ground state of a nucleus, of course, all the energy levels below the Fermi level are going to be filled. And then if it gets into an excited state, the nucleon will hop, hop up temporarily into one of these excited states until it eventually decays back into the ground state. And this is a very similar idea to what you see for electrons in an atom.
Okay, now you can calculate your, the, your Fermi energy. Your book does this. The Fermi energy is defined as the, um, the energy magnitude between the bottom of this well and then the Fermi energy, which is the top level. So you would find the bottom of the well via some mathematical computation, add the Fermi energy onto it, and then that would give you the Fermi level, which is the highest unfilled state. Um, the highest highest um, unfilled state, or the highest filled state actually, will of course have a negative value because it's bonded, right? It's bound. It's a bound system. Now we can use the stuff that we um, studied about the Fermi Dirac distribution function in a previous chapter um, to find the Fermi energy. The equation that we derived for the Fermi energy was um, h squared over 2m, 3n over 8 pi v to the 2 thirds power. And that was derived in a previous chapter. And so that's going to give us the depth of the well. Now it's going to be different for protons and neutrons because of course um, the potentials are different. Okay. So let's just get an order of magnitude for this. Remember your Fermi energies for the conduction electrons, for example, um, were on the order of a few electron volts. And if you do the computation, you can see that as opposed to the Fermi energy for conduction electrons, the Fermi energy for nucleons bound in a nucleus is on the order of tens of MeV. So this is, you know, seven orders of magnitude larger than the Fermi energy for conduction electrons, as you might expect. But just to run through the calculation with you, using an order of magnitude, um, if you look at uh, tellurium 125, an isotope of tellurium, it's got 73 neutrons, okay? And then uh, 125 would of course be the mass number. So we can calculate the radius using our little equation r naught a to the one third, and we get that the radius of that nucleus is six femtometers. And then the volume of the nucleus would be four thirds pi r cubed, which would give you 905 femtometers cubed for your volume. Now, we're going to use our Fermi energy equation here. So we have H squared over 2M. We're going to look at just the neutrons. Remember, you'd have to view the neutrons and the protons separately. So I'm going to plug in the mass of a neutron in MeV per C squared units. It's 939.6, okay? And then you multiply um, 3 over 8 pi times N over V. Well, N would be the number, which would be 73 neutrons. And then V is 905 centimeters cubed, and then you raise that to 2 thirds power. Now, here's an interesting little unit trick. You might notice here in my um, h squared over 2m that I have h squared over 2, 939.6 MeV over c squared. Remember that c squared is not just part of the units, that's actually a number, okay? So what we would do is we would move that c squared up to the numerator. So it's h squared times c squared, okay? We would put that up top. Now, HC is a constant that's often used um, because, for example, the energy of photon is E is equal to HF, which is equal to HC over lambda. You have to multiply H and C together a lot in these formulae, and so you can look it up, um, or you can, I can show it to you here. If you put H in EV seconds, it's 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15th, um, and then uh, if you put the speed of light in terms of the number of nanometers per second, it would be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second times 10 to the 9th nanometers per meter, which would give you 3 times 10 to the 17th nanometers per second. Now, if you multiply 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15 times 3 times 10 to the 17, that should be 10 to the 17, I'm sorry for the typo, I'll fix it on the slide, then um, you get 1240.8 EV nanometers, which is a weird unit, um, but uh, is useful in those E is equal to HC over lambda equations because some, so often the wavelengths are given in nanometers, so it's useful there. But for our purposes, maybe femtometers and MeV would be better. Now, that's nice because when you convert from EV to mega EV, right, then you're multiplying times 10 to the sixth. And when you convert from nanometers to femtometers, then you're multiplying times 10 to the minus 6. So those two things cancel out, and it turns out that HC is also 1240.8 MeV per femtometer. So that's nice, because when I plug it into this formula, I have 1240.8 MeV femtometers squared divided by 2, 939.6 MeV, so the MeVs are going to cancel their top and bottom. Now here you have femtometers squared on the top, but look here, in my formula where I calculated my volume, I have femtometers 
cubed, 1 over femtometers cubed raised to the 2 thirds power. So that would give me 1 over femtometers squared. So it all cancels out, and then I have my, um, my, have my units here. So I'm just left with MeV squared over MeV, leaving 37 MeV. So the units are a little tricky there. Go through it, make sure that you um, can figure it out on your own so that you really understand before you try and use it in a homework problem. Now, one other interesting thing that uh, the shell model can help us with is understanding why some elements are radioactive. Now, we can understand that large nuclei are going to get radioactive after they pass a certain point, right? The strong force, the nuclear force is short range, and so if you keep tacking nucleons on, eventually it gets to the point where they're so big and fat that the ones on this side don't feel any nuclear force from the ones on this side, and they just can't hold together anymore and it ejects an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus, making the nucleus smaller and then more stable because uh, the nuclear force is so short range. So we can understand alpha decay, which is one form of radiation in that way. But then there's beta decay, which happens for light nuclei, and maybe that's not as straightforward. So for example, to uh, give you a hint here, let's look at carbon-12, okay? Carbon-12 has an atomic number of six. It's got six protons, therefore, and six neutrons. Now that's nice and stable. Remember, even, even configurations, if you have an even number of protons and even number of neutrons, you got those spins all paired up, up and down, and that's nice and stable. So carbon-12, stable nucleus. Now, let's say that we add another proton to the mix, okay? And then you have 13 nitrogen. You have six neutrons and seven protons. Now you can see here um, that you have a proton and then you have this unfilled neutron energy state that this nucleon would really like to be in because it's a lower energy. And so that's exactly what happens. This proton decays, falls into this lower energy neutron state, actually becomes a neutron, okay, and um, radiation is emitted, okay? So then it becomes carbon-13, and carbon-13 is stable, okay? So, interesting. Um, so that's called beta decay. We're going to talk more about different radioactivity and stability and Q values and activation energies for radioactive decay in future lectures. But for now, hopefully that helps you understand some of these nuclear models. Please let me know if you have any questions.